I'm Claire Parker. And I'm Ashley Hamilton. And, and this, this is Celebrity Memoir, Memoir Book, Book Club. Club. Thank you so much to Bull and Branch for supporting our show. Bull and Branch created a new standard in betting by doing things the right way, not the easy way. Experience the best sheets you've ever felt at bullandbranch.com. Get exclusive access to a post-sale 20% site-wide discount through the end of April with the promo code WORM at bullandbranch.com. And thank you to Dame for supporting the Celebrity Memoir Book Club. Get 10% off your first order at dameproducts.com when you use the promo code WORM. And Ashley, for everyone who's a first-time listener, what should they expect? Well, they should expect something a little different than your everyday book club, okay? I would argue no. I would argue they should expect something a little bit different than your everyday ingredient list. Sure. I just feel like we're something between an ingredient list and a book club. I think an everyday book club is a club where no one has ever even heard of or mentioned a book. That is true. Famously, in my mom's book club, nobody's ever read the book. <laughs> and I think an ingredient list is quite famously full of uh, flour and dust. But here, here at Celebrity Memoir Book Club, we are legitimately reading the books, adding a sprinkle of spice, dust, and sugar. Yeah. How do you cook? <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, we are two comedians, best friends. We're going to talk about the book. We're going to talk about what we think about the book. And we're going to talk about what we talk about when we're actually talking about the book. Yes, along with some wild accusations. And if you don't like that, as always, you are free to just find a different thing to listen to for one hour and 15 minutes. And if you do like it, Ashley will be thanking our five-star Apple reviewers at the end of this podcast because we appreciate you so much. And... The one and only housekeeping note I have today. It is okay. going to go so freaking fast. My Australian worms. My worms who live in Europe. My worms who are morning people. My worms who are late, late, late night people. <laughs> and my worms who are wherever you want, wherever you want, at any time of the day people. People who love to just have something queued up to turn on whenever they friggin' feel like it. We are doing a Moment House digital live show Wednesday, April 27th, 8 p.m. Australian time in Sydney and Melbourne. And then... We are going to be live at 6 a.m. New York City, which means we have to wake up at like 5 a.m., which is tough stuff. What are we going to do with Bug? You can't take her to daycare at 6 a.m. No, Bug's just going to be in her crate in the other room, I suppose. So we're going to be up at 6 a.m. reading and analyzing a Lily Collins essay. Plus, there is a live chat so you guys can throw in your opinions. And we love to just answer questions, chat with you guys. I feel like you guys have a lot of great insights that are so much fun to bring into the show. So it is such a fun experience to be able to watch an episode and be in the episode. You guys are a huge part of it. So get your tickets at Moment House. They're $8 now, but they do go up around the time of the show. I'm so excited to see you guys all there. I can't wait. I can't wait. I have no idea what Lily Collins is about. I do. It's about beauty. (laughs) Okay. It's a vulnerable book of essays about beauty. <laughs> okay. Well, definitely tune in for that one. Claire. Yes. If people are tuning in to hear about your week last week as a chapter of your memoir, mm-hmm. what would you call it? I would call it Woman of My Word. Okay. Because last week I was having a really bad week emotionally. Sure. Breakdowns were happening, crying in the streets, shaking in my room. I was not doing good. In my head. Yes. (laughs) And you know what I did? What? I went back to my old therapist. If you guys don't know, we do an advice column called Worm to the Wise once a month on the Patreon. And we're always like, just go talk to somebody and help yourself, help yourself. And I took my own freaking advice. And I was like, you know what? I'm not doing good. I should just go talk to somebody professional. And it really helped. I'm feeling a lot better. I'm feeling a lot calmer. Good. Sometimes you just got to get it off your chest to somebody and hear a hear a perspective I love perspective and yeah I'm just really proud of myself I'm proud of you too taking positive steps if you were a celebrity and to write a memoir what would the chapter of last week's memoir be called uh it would be called bug needs a chill pill sure because bug is taking a lot of pills and none of them make her chill she was frightening me the other day actually we were trying to watch a movie and I was legitimately scared of bug she was not biting but she was jumping at me teeth first (laughs) The thing is, right now, she loves to go for long walks and play, but only when she's in the specific mood to. If she's not in the mood, she will just lay on the ground. So, like, when it's time to go for a walk, she'll just lay on the ground, and then she'll have all this pent-up energy four hours later when I'm trying to watch a movie or just hang out with my friends, and I'm like, Bug, we got to do my schedule, not yours. This is not fair to me. I work so hard to keep you happy. I take you to the doctor every fucking day because there's always something wrong. Right now, it's that she's allergic to chicken. 
Can you believe dogs can be allergic to chicken? Especially because there's so much loose chicken in this city, it turns out. I know. Well, chicken bones are like a whole separate hazard, (laughs) separate from being allergic to chicken. But I had her like eating a chicken-based food, and then she was getting little pimples on her tummy. (laughs) And I had to go to the doctor and be like, what's up with these little pimples on her tummy? And they were like, oh, puppy acne. And I was like, she's a teen. (laughs) And they were like, no, it's allergies. And I was like, well, what the fuck? Oh, my God. Actually, today is... Author du jour, the memoirist of the week, is a huge dog lover. And she has a dog that she caters to who sounds like a bug-esque nightmare. (laughs) The flashy girl from Flushing. The nanny named Fran. This week we are reading Enter Whining, the Fran Drescher memoir from 1996. At the height of her fame came this collection of dinner party stories. (laughs) Yeah, you guys, I will say, as much as I love Fran, I am a huge Fran Drescher fan. A Fran fan. Fran Fine fan. This is a hard book to read. This is like a real reread the book so you don't have to. I feel like we've had a couple where we're like, wow, honestly, go out and get this. This one, I'm like, all right, I'm sure there are people who wanted to know what was in it. I still don't know if I know what was in it. It gets convoluted. At page 50, I think I called Ashley and said, should we abandon this and try another book? And I think Ashley's mentality was like, no, it's going to get better. And then somehow it got worse. (laughs) But it's cute. There's some fun stories. I mean, I do think it's a really interesting look at PR in the 90s because this came out pre-Instagram, pre-blogs, before any celebrity was really... There wasn't even internet in the 90s. That's so true. (laughs) But it did. It came out when this was the main way that you would cultivate your persona outside of your role, which was the role of her. I'm excited to get into it. I do like her a lot. She is somebody who, even though I didn't like the book, I would love to go to dinner with her. Oh, she seems so sweet and so fun and just like warm and entertaining. And then you're just like, but not a writer and not even a a book teller. I don't know who she told this book to, but they shouldn't have written it the way she said it. One thing I do like about this book is that it's filled with photos. There's a photo on every other page. It's very picture book, scrapbook esque. And it gave me a whole new appreciation for how beautiful she is. She does have like just a striking face where you're like, of course, of course, you're supposed to be on television. That's a You've got a face for television. She has a perfect combo of like girl next door, sexy and cute. And then also just like strikingly beautiful. And I'm so happy for her. She got exactly what she deserved, which was a hit TV show. Exactly. (laughs) And a gay husband who could really appreciate that beautiful face. Let's get into the book. So Francine Joy Drescher was born September 30th, 1957 in Flushing, New York, which is very important to her. She's 64 years old now, but this book came out in 1996 when she was 38, 39. I'm very grateful that she chose to go by Fran and not Francine. I just don't think that that fits her. It doesn't, but it fits the fact that her sister's name is Nadine. Francine and Nadine. Do you you hear the similarities? Yeah, I don't love it. (laughs) I also want to point out, so this book came out at the height of the nanny fame. The nanny was on from 1993 to 1999. So this book was written smack dab in the middle, season three. I think when it was really at its peak. Yes, she references season three a lot. She also does have another book called Cancer Schmancer that came out more recently. This book came out before that book. So Cancer Schmancer is about her battle with breast cancer, which she did not yet know was coming when she wrote this. Also, I think it's of note, she wrote this book like three years before her and her husband got a divorce and he came out as gay. Yes, that is important to note. When we get to the content about their relationships, it's something to keep in your mind. Okay, so it opens with a bit. She decides to open it with a little joke on us, the reader. A little April Fool's, if you will. It's a very sexually tense Do you want to read it? I guess. It's inappropriate. So trigger warning for inappropriate language. (laughs) My assistant informed me that I was being summoned by the president of the company, my boss, a king among kings, and a barracuda. But how else do you get to the top at his age? I opened the door and saw him, a snake in Armani. Come to daddy, he said in anything but a fatherly tone, and I obeyed as he pulled off his crocodile belt and cracked it against his massive mahogany desk. How could I have let myself get into the situation and why couldn't I bring myself to stop? But he was my addiction and I his slave. As I stood before him, my thighs quivered and my nipples hardened as he slowly unbuttoned my blouse with one hand and began to reach under my skirt, sliding up between my legs with the other. Not. (laughs) (laughs) So then she's like, I was told that you got to hook him with the first paragraph. That never happened to me. That's not my story. And I was... I have to say let down. I was like, I mean, Fran, I get the concept of hooking somebody with something interesting. But you're supposed to do that with something from your life. Don't bait and switch me. I was kind of like, ooh, this is a hot, sexy book. And then nothing else in this book was as interesting 
as that made up paragraph. Well, until the last paragraph where she brings it full circle and gives us another falsy. The first chapter is really about her upbringing. She doesn't give a lot about anything. I was saying, I think this book is like a perfect example of medium talk, not small talk, not deep talk. She would be the perfect person to sit next to at a dinner party. She's got amazing, funny little stories. She's got quick little anecdotes that are like fun and charming and warm. And I think she's a bit more open than most people are. She seems like she'd be wonderful to talk to at a party like a true joy to spend a couple of hours with like you would leave and be like I have a new friend and then you would never really meet up but so she grew up in Flushing Queens she was raised in a very Jewish family like culturally I'd say it doesn't seem like they were super religious no but it does seem like they were really Yiddish slangy yeah so the first chapter opens with her childhood and the fact that she has been with the same man at the time of writing since she had been 15 years old they met in high school they're both from Flushing he was hot she was hot they both were into theater that's where they met and they were like the theater kids they were together from that age on and she just talks about how her family adored him and she tells this story like her life reads like a sitcom and I do think because she was in a sitcom and the sitcom was based off of her and as you'll see all the characters in the nanny are based off of her life this book was sort of to round out like the persona that you know like if you think this is Fran's life wait till you hear about her mom yeah so she talks about their relationship she says a lot of people ask what we attribute our 17 year marriage to screaming we fight and yell and sometimes hit rock bottom just like everyone else but we both want our marriage to work so we don't hesitate to seek therapy when we have problems i do feel like if they hadn't broken up because he was gay this would have been really good advice yeah also that they laugh together all the time they laugh till they cry she says i really do believe that part of what made it work was that they were best friends who respected each other and had the same goals and came from this not that flushing is a small town but they came from the same background and wanted to go to the same place and that is like hugely comforting but she does say peter later admitted he thought i was the most beautiful girl he had ever seen and then i spoke who knew that combo would intrigue him even more but it did you got a face out of vogue and a voice out of selma diamond he often quips listen i don't want to be stereotypical but I do feel like for a 50 year old boy to be like wow you've got a face that belongs in vogue is like a bad sign so like you said this book is like dinner party anecdotes it's like sitcom b plots like a lot of it is very funny situations that just come from her real life that don't really coalesce into any greater story other than the story of her life. I would say you get a sense of her personality, but you wouldn't get a sense of who she is emotionally. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Like I get a sense of like how fun and warm and great she is to work with, but she doesn't delve deep. No. So she, here's what she gives you about her upbringing. I come from very humble background. I was born in New York City. Well, actually Queens. Well, actually Flushing. And honey, it's a world away from Manhattan. When I was a young child, my dad worked two jobs to support us. But when he got home, he always made sure he kissed me and my sister Nadine goodnight, even if we were fast asleep. We felt his love. And my mother, the most loving, happy person I'll ever have the privilege of knowing, created an adoring, wonderful, and safe environment in which we kids were able to blossom. They always said, we don't have a lot of money, but we're very rich, and we were. It really is like the perfect family sitcom in the 90s about like there's funny stuff and there's crazy stuff and there's hijinks and they butt heads and everybody's mad and then everyone's happy, but at the end of the day, they just love each other. That just is who she is. Yeah, and everybody's like very two-dimensional in their caricature. Do you know what I mean? So her mom is like this loving, happy woman who – is always complaining boisterous. of boisterous and always complaining how she can't eat before a flight because she's just too nervous. But anyway, could you give her a bite of corn? You know what I mean? Like, so the, the story she tells about how much her mom loved her boyfriend was even in high school. Like there was this huge storm and she was like, God, I could really go for a Sunday with wet nuts. And he went out in like a torrential downpour, came back with a Sunday dry nuts. And she goes, uh, but I can't really eat it unless they're wet. And he's like, do you want me to go back out in the storm for you? And she's like, could you? <laughs> Just like all these funny little stories that I do feel, I guess like life imitates art and art imitates life, baby. Yeah. She said, a happy family, good health, an ice cream sundae with wet nuts and a $2 movie at the multiplex pretty much answers all their prayers, especially if they can sneak into another feature. That's just like who her family is. They love what they love and it's very simple. But she has big dreams. She has big dreams. So I guess in high school, she was really beautiful. She doesn't bring that up here, but she must have been because she starts applying to beauty pageants. She applies to her first New York City high school beauty pageant. It's called the Miss New York Teenager Pageant. And she's the first runner up. And she uses this immediately to leverage her next success, which is each day after school, I would dial talent agencies and introduce myself with my new title. Hello, my name is Fran Drescher, and I'm the winner of the Miss New York Teenage Pageant. 
So I exaggerated a little. Sue me. <laughs> Meanwhile, I got myself an agent. So she was very ambitious and just like went out and got it done. And I do think she's somebody who lived the life that she should have. She was a beautiful, funny girl who went after her dreams and they worked out as it should. <laughs> like you're just like, yeah, why not you? And there was struggle. Like she's been through stuff. It's not like it was just a smooth sailing. Like she walked into Hollywood and was like, hello, Hollywood, I'm here. And then she was the star of a show. The nanny didn't happen till her 30s, but she did have successes. There was never like a drought that was so long there was no reason for her to continue. Like she yeah. had a good sense that it was all going to click into place. She was always paying her bills with acting from the day she decided to do it. So first she got her first role, which was in New York. She was doing a little bit part in Saturday Night Fever. Yeah. And she had to use her own words, chutzpah. A lot of chutzpah. Like I said, there is like just so much personality in these pages. It doesn't go deep, but you do. She's a strong voice. Yeah. She's a really strong voice in it. I mean, literally and figuratively. <laughs> like this line, I feel like is very indicative of the voice you get throughout the book where she talks about being an extra in a bunch of projects. And she says, all right, he was the star and I was an extra. But remember, there are no small parts, just small salaries. And you're like, that's funny. That's funny stuff. I think she had such a supportive family that she had like no doubt or shame, which I think is great. Like I wish... I was more like that. But she tells a story about she was an extra in the background of some movie. The casting director really liked her. They put her in everything. They put her in the background of everything. And in the background of some big shopping mall scene, she dropped her bag. And so she started flailing her arms to try to get the director's attention to like shut down the scene because she was worried about continuity errors because she had dropped her own bag. And she's like way in the back. And when nobody would stop the scene for her, she yelled cut. She, as an 18-year-old extra, yelled cut from the background of a major motion film. And they were like, what the fuck are you doing? With Gary Busey in it. Our first speaking role is in Saturday Night Fever with John Travolta. And it is a small bit part. So it is one of those parts that does get left on the cutting room floor more often than not. Or sometimes not even shot. Like if they're running behind schedule, they'll be like, whatever, this scene is trash. We're not going to do it. And that's almost what happened. John Travolta was not having a good day. There were plenty of people trying to coax him into working some more that afternoon. But I guess the grueling schedule coupled with the recent death of his girlfriend was more than he could bear. You want a steak, John, one guy offered? Maybe he needs a cold drink, said another. But like watching a Greek tragedy, I watched Travolta get cemented into his lump-like position in a corner as my part was going down the drain. Okay, enough's enough, I thought. And I marched my way over to John to try to salvage what was fast becoming a disaster. Mine. So she goes up to John Travolta. She has two lines in this whole movie. She's 19 years old and says, you know, John, maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but you're a trooper. Whatever happened to let's go on with the show. So what if you're tired? So what if you're run down? Maybe they will have to check you into a hospital for exhaustion in the end. But you know what? Right now, I expect you to act like the star that you are and finish the scene. Then we can all go home. Did that just come out of me? Am I crazy? Am I fired? Am I nauseous? He looked at me. Oi. He stood up. Double oi. And finally, he spoke. Thanks. I needed that. Come on. Let's dance. John Travolta grabbed my hand, pulled me onto the lighted disco floor and began to lead me like no man has ever led me before. Incredible. I can't believe she did that. I would have left. I would have been like, it doesn't look like we're shooting this scene. I better go hide. Yeah. And if they see that I'm here, I could get in trouble. So the very next thing she gets into is American Hot Wax, co-starring Jay Leno, who she maintains is the best on-screen kiss she's ever had. She said maybe it's something about the chin, but he's a really good kisser. And I'm like, that can't be true. It can be true that your chin leads the kissing. But so she's like the star of American Hot Wax. Yeah, so she's in that movie with Jay Leno, and they move out to Los Angeles. She specifies the Queens of L.A., the San Fernando Valley, which you guys know I am an absolute valley stan. I think it's the best part of Los Angeles. So she moves out there. It's her and Peter, and they're going to pursue their dreams. And it's not like they're hitting the ground running success after success, but they have enough to keep them going, and they have a lot of fun. They live in this apartment complex that, looking back, was absolutely star-studded. She said they used to hang out with Dennis Quaid, David Caruso, and Rosanna Arquette around the pool. They were so excited to have a pool. They really, she never loses her queensiness. No, and I think that's what this book is about, and I feel like reading it, imagining myself in 1996 as a fan of the show, like who would be buying this book, who would be reading it, they really did a great job of making her feel like your best friend. You really do feel like like your best friend's older sister who went out and had this amazing life is still the same girl from next door and she's coming home and she's going to let you in on all the secrets and she's just as excited as you would be. I do find that true throughout the book that she's so excited about all of her success and like this really like earnest, naive way that's so likable. 
I mean, I do think that she is thrilled for the way things have worked mm-hmm. out for her. I don't think that she had like any expectation. I will say that it does literally read like she's talking to you. A lot of the sentences are so mumbly jumbly they just go from like one part of a story to like a completely different story and you're like I'm sorry I feel like we've changed movies and she didn't really specify and we'll get into it like some of the choice of stories she manages to give so many different stories without giving any true emotion or depth or vulnerability yeah so one thing that I noticed as notably absent is Peter's decision to quit acting. So when they first moved out to LA, obviously they'd met in the theater program. They both wanted to be actors. They moved out to LA together to become actors. They were both auditioning for commercials, just auditioning for all kinds of things. And Peter was actually a lot more successful in landing commercials than she was for a while. And then he moved to just writing and producing and sort of writing and producing for her. And that is something that I would have loved to read in a book about like being a showbiz couple who one person makes it and the other one doesn't, but instead decides to just like move behind and be like, I will support my partner. It's weird because it doesn't seem like she got a lot of commercial roles, but she got a lot of like big roles. Yeah. So after she was in American Hot Wax with Jay Leno, she gets Hollywood Nights co-starring a then unknown Michelle Pfeiffer. And I'll tell you, she was absolutely gorgeous. She wore these short shorts. In my life, the girl had the thinnest thighs I've ever seen. My mother thought they were too thin. She would. I just feel like that is so like you ran into someone at the grocery store. I don't know. Yeah. So then we get to her and Peter's wedding. They weren't necessarily obsessed with getting married it just kind of felt like the right thing to do they grew up in Queens everyone from their neighborhood was getting married and they were gonna be together she said they'd had a joint fake account since high school yeah they paid for her ring over three carats to the naked eye it's gorgeous but under the microscope they're shoveling coal in there (laughs) I thought that was so funny but yeah she says they paid for it with this joint account who has a high school savings account with their boyfriend I don't even think I had a bank account in high school. It really was crazy. But she does have this whole thing about how she had to get this big carrot because all of the girls from home had these bumbas on their fingers. And she goes, and pretentious, I mean, Peter wanted me to have a bumba too. He goes, it was so weird. All these girls without a pot to piss in with these rocks on their hands. Anyway, so she talks about like the anarchy of this wedding, which it's hard to read this chapter goes all over the place there's a lot of drama over literally everybody's dress and I will be honest I'm gonna say in absolute honesty reading Fran Drescher's memoir I could not give two fucks about her grandma's dress to Fran's wedding well not only (laughs) that but it was one of those things where like I guess the joke is that her mom was so upset over nothing that it was like ridiculous but at the same time you're like I actually am genuinely confused what she was upset about. You're not describing it well. I truly cannot follow what's happening here. I think her friend and her grandma wore the same dress (laughs) with their names painted on them. (laughs) Yeah, there was a dress that they found at a beach store that had their names in rhinestones in tulle. I don't know. And there was like, what color would everybody wear? I have to say, as beautiful as Fran Drescher is, she wore one of the ugliest wedding outfits I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, well, it just, it had like a cap to it. Like a swimming cap. Like imagine if instead of a veil, you had a bridal swimming cap. With a veil on it. (laughs) And it also had rhinestones. I will say she looks like a princess in that way where like your outfit is so ugly, you must be royal. (laughs) This is so funny to me. She said, my mother had her hair done the day before and sat up all night in the living room chair in fear of deflation. (laughs) She also had this thing where like there was no room in the parking lot for her wedding guests. So everyone had to park around the corner. And then somebody who was supposed to bring the cigars, his car got stolen while he like ran in to the 7-Eleven. So her dad had to go pick him up and then they couldn't park anywhere. So they had to take like a... They had to go back to the 7-Eleven to park and then take a cab to the wedding. These are really stories that I think (laughs) just make people laugh until they pee at a Thanksgiving. (laughs) But if you were somebody's date to that Thanksgiving, you'd be like, oh, yeah, you had to be there, huh? (laughs) These are big you had to be there. You had to be there. And you love her for telling you. You're so excited to be invited to Thanksgiving at Fran's house, but you also cannot keep up with the jokes. Her sister set her hair on fire at one point, and she had to, like, dump a celery dish on her head. Once again, everything reads like a sitcom episode. Big book of hijinks. A sitcom episode that hasn't been like fleshed out into the actual storylines yet. They're like, all right, here are the things that could happen. Here's something funny I heard happen to my aunt. What if we put this in the show and people are like, what? Mm." (laughs) And then she said she just went and sat in the car for the second half of the wedding because her feet hurt. They had their wedding night at her childhood home. Like they went back to her parents' house and slept in her bedroom. That's so cute. Okay, so then they're back in L.A., married, and they meet this woman named Elaine who invites them to a party, and it kicks off just like a lifetime of friendship and agentship. 
So Elaine becomes their agent. This is like some more funny observations about this first big Hollywood party that they get invited to. She was waiting in line for the bathroom and she says, oddly enough, it was always occupied and there seemed to be several voices coming from behind the locked door. Talk about a spastic colon, I thought, and in vain offered my Pepto-Bismol to the eight sniffling people who were exiting. What is it? Allergy season? All right. So I was naive in those days. She also says there was a famous, famous actress there who got so drunk she passed out in the middle of the living room and nobody even noticed until she was in the way of the buffet. Anyway, so Elaine and Alan end up becoming best couples friends with them. They have a couple good couples friends. They're big couples people. Yeah. Yeah. I think when you spend that much of your life as a couple, you mostly make couples friends. So in the chapter called Elaine, she tells six or seven different stories that happen with Elaine that are funny. And they are all funny, but they kind of amount to nothing. But the whole chapter ends on they have over this famous TV exec for dinner. And they're like excited to wine and dine him. And then he gets there and he's acting so weird. And he like takes off his shoes and he's like, my feet are cold. So Peter has to go get him socks. And then he passes out, like, cold. And they don't know what to do, so they just put him on the couch and they eat lasagna, waiting for him to come through. And when he finally wakes up, he just, like, runs away and drives off and they never see him again. And he stole the socks. And that is, like, a funny story. And I do think, if I went out to L.A. and called up my old friend Fran from Flushing... And we were talking about, like, these crazy TV exec stories like oh my god I had this crazy meeting and she's like you won't believe this dinner I would be like that is a funny story but in this book you're like okay so then she gets spinal tap which she almost didn't take because the pay was really low and the project was kind of confusing at that point and I feel like we tribute these mumblecore mostly improvised movies to the late 2000s but she says spinal tap was almost completely improvised there was a 25 page outline that the entire cast got and from there it was just kind of make it funny yeah she says they have like 300 hours of footage that they whittled down to 90 minutes that's insane that they were able to do that because I will tell you very few people are able to make a good movie down to 90 minutes and they should all be 90 minutes I mean me and Ashley just watched marry me that was two hours was it only two because it felt like a hundred so this ends up being an incredible experience for her she gets to work with some of the funniest people in the game and she really stands her own she has some great improvised scenes she has one improvisation that accidentally like ties the whole movie together and she says I'll tell you, is a lesson to be learned during one's career that work brings work. So be reticent about turning down anything. All told, I think I worked three or four days. I wore my own clothes and did my own hair and makeup. But I unfortunately developed a bad cold and was quite miserable throughout the shoot. One thing about Fran Fine is she She gets sick a lot. We skipped some other sections, but this is the second or third cold she's had so far in the book. We're on page 58. Yeah, that like ruined a major experience. She needs more (laughs) vitamin C in her diet. She reminds me of Bug. The other big thing that comes out of her experience doing Spinal Tap is she becomes best couple friends with Dan Aykroyd, who you may know as the The father from Crossroads. (laughs) And he marries Donna Dixon, who's one of... Peter and Fran's good friends and they set them up and they are to this day I think couple best friends she always calls them Danny and Donna but then we get to a point in her career where they're like obviously things are going well but they're not going well enough and a lot of the feedback we're getting is that if you didn't have this accent you'd be more eligible for all of the roles instead of specific roles that sound just like you so she goes to a voice coach to try and get her words to stop coming out of her nose basically and she can't do it at a normal cadence. She says, I saw the doctor once or twice a week. I was doing pretty well, but talking a little slow, sounding like Meryl Streep on a Quaalude. And that ends up just being the major problem. She can get her accent off, but she can't talk at a normal clip without it. And so she does this audition. She does really well. And they were like, we liked her. We just can't have this movie be 15 hours long and it takes her too long to get through a sentence and then ironically she had auditioned for the main role in the movie fame where i guess she's supposed to be a woman who's trying to become a successful singer and so when she gets the role she goes into intensive singing classes to try to get better and she shows up at the very first rehearsal and they're like why do you sound like that and she's like i worked so hard i got as good as i could and they're like yeah it's too good we hired you because you sucked at singing and she got cut from the role I don't understand why she couldn't have just gone back to being bad at singing. I also don't understand why nobody told her that that's what the role was. Like, didn't she read the script? How did she have that little understanding of what the movie was about? Well, it wasn't the movie. It was the TV show version of fame, which I don't think ended up being anything special. So I don't think it's the worst thing in the world that she got cut from it. So then around then in her late 20s, they find a lump in her breast and she has to get surgery. Luckily, it turns out to be benign. But but this chapter really stressed me out because she says recovering from this surgery to get the benign lump removed was the worst pain that she's ever been in. And as we now know, she had 
not benign tumors in her breast later. So it, it made me feel really sad that she had to go through this again and worse. So she found out right before Memorial Day weekend that she had these lumps and they weren't going to be able to do surgery until the following week. And so she had these plans with her friends for the weekend that was supposed to take her mind off of it. And those friends canceled. And Fran was understandably angry that her friends had flaked on her. Like when she really needed it. Yeah. In the middle of a cancer scare. So she goes to her friend Elaine's and she says, I expressed how hurt I was by my friend's insensitivity to my situation and remembered how I agonized for her well-being when she'd had a tumor removed just a few months before. For this I said, I was like, was there something in the L.A. water? Why were so many women in their 20s getting tumors removed? It was Elaine who set me straight on a few matters about friends and expectations. That Memorial Day weekend at Elaine's, I learned one of the more valuable lessons of my life. Know before whom thou stands. Understand your friends for who they are, not who you wish them to be. Accept them for their flaws as well as their attributes. Turn to them for their strengths, what good stuff they can bring to your life, and forget about the rest. To ask for more only sets you up for failure. That's really good advice. And it is great advice. And she goes, once we learned this, Peter and I became far more tolerant and independent friends to our friends. Consequently, we remain good friends with so many wonderful people, some for almost 20 years. And I do think that that is a great lesson. It's a lesson I need to like work on what to expect from whom. And like you can't expect everything from everyone. But I will say I don't think it's too big an expectation for somebody that you consider more than an acquaintance to be there for you when you have cancer. She wasn't asking for someone to move into her house and like take care of her children. She said, I'm trying to go to the pool because I'm sad right now. Can you come to? I'm planning a barbecue. Could you make it? I have cancer. You can make that barbecue. You can make that barbecue. I don't think that's too much to ask. I mean, these are bad friends. And they were like, well, these people are historically flaky. And I'm like, okay, but did you historically have cancer? No, this is a different thing. And then the story does end in a funny way. She's in all this pain. That's not the funny part, but she's in terrible pain. She's at home and she goes, once I was home and fully loaded on Percodin, Peter propped me up in the den and ordered me a large cheese pizza. Well, I hadn't even been home an hour when the phone started ringing off the hook. Guess everyone wanted to see how I was doing. Well, guess again. By some amazing coincidence, a huge cover story had broken in the Enquired tabloid revealing the up till now secret marriage of Danny Aykroyd and Donna Dixon. Not one person started the conversation with, is she all right, but rather, is it true? What a joke. There I sat, bandaged like an Egyptian mummy, two huge tumors removed. I'd probably gotten by within an inch of my life, and Danny and Donna, without even trying, had upstaged my surgery. <laughs> that is funny. LA, baby. Bottom line only. So then we get into this chapter about a project she did with Warren Beatty. This is the best gossip in the book. This is really she good She shouldn't have blown her load so quick, I think, but it's wild. So... She's doing this small role in a movie with Warren Beatty. They click immediately. And there's a lot of things moving about in this movie. A lot of smaller characters are being cut, replaced. The movie is Ishtar, which I'd never heard of. It sounds like it is infamously awful. Yeah. And like way over budget and apparently didn't make sense. Yeah. So she says that one of the best things about this movie is that she was being put up in New York for rehearsals. And because she is from New York and had a lot of friends here, she was just staying with a friend and then using the money that was supposed to be for hotels as a per diem and just spending thousands of dollars on partying. So in the middle of a weekend, she finds out she has this audition for a Warren Beatty and Elaine May movie. She's at the middle of a party. She gets ready. She goes and she walks in and there's Warren Beatty and he's so handsome and immediately he like locks eyes with her and she's like, he really does make you feel like you're the only woman in the room. And she's like, I recognize now that he probably made every actress feel that way. But she's like, we had a connection that nobody's ever had in their lifetime. (laughs) So he brings her in. They have her read for the movie. And Warren Beatty's like, she's amazing. She's perfect. We have to have her, right? And Elaine's like, next girl, please. We're, we have a schedule and we're behind. And so he walks her to the elevator and he gives her his number. He says, you can call me anytime, day or night. I don't care if I'm sleeping, eating or in a meeting. I will take your call. I have to say that made me horny to hear. And then he's like, yeah, I watch movies with my friend Jack. Jack Nicholson, I thought. My attorney, a small group. And we screen a film and have dinner. Call me towards the end of the week. And if I'm doing one, I'd love to have you and Pete. And he goes, by the way. And she goes, yes. I think I know your husband. What's he do? And she goes, he's an actor and a writer, but you don't know him. And he goes, are you sure? Because I think I might have met him once. And then she kept being like, Warren, if you knew my husband, we'd know about it. Don't worry about it. Dude, I I wonder. wonder. I don't know if like Warren Beatty is known to be bisexual or anything. I do know he's like hypersexual and in L.A. So I wonder if her husband had hooked up with Warren Beatty and kept it a secret. I would love to hear about that now. Me too. But anyway, they don't get to go to the movie when hang out with him. But she goes to New York to film this film. So she gets to the movie and he gives her a call and he's like, we're going to have a good time. And she's like, at that point, I felt 
a bit off. Like, mm, okay, the vibes are wrong now. I don't know if I love this. And she gets there and she has this really tiny part that they kind of wrote for her. She's in a single scene, but for some reason she's at the table read and rehearsal for every single day. And she's like, it's weird that I'm here and like the top build people are not, but whatever. He wants me here. So I guess I have to be here. And his very beautiful girlfriend is also in this movie. Her name is Isabel Ajani. She's French. So that rehearsal one point and this very famous casting director is there and he calls Fran over and she's like kind of excited because here's this important casting director and she goes over and then he points to his knee and says, come sit on my lap. Now, call me crazy, but I felt embarrassed and somehow like a piece of meat, maybe because the casting guy was in mid conversation with him, but the request seemed disrespectful to both of us. And I said, you'll sit on my lap before I'll be sitting on yours, which I think is a great comeback. And I was proud of her. As if he hadn't heard me, he began to tell the casting director what a brilliant young actress I was while guiding me with his hands on his lap. Like an idiot, I was bounced on Warren Beatty's lap while he sang my praises to this casting director. Well, as soon as he stopped telling the guy how great I was, you can be sure I got up and marched off, feeling somehow soiled but maintaining my dignity. Warren was the most powerful and openly aggressive man I'd ever met, and I was clearly out of his league when it came to experience. Plus, he was so cute in his baseball cap and sneakers, it was difficult to ever feel like anything but an awkward schoolgirl. So then... A couple days after that, he asks, have you ever met my girlfriend, Isabel Ajani? I hadn't, but was interested in meeting her. She was this beautiful French actress with round cheeks, white porcelain skin, and berry stained lips. So he's like, well, let's go meet her. She's just down the hall in wardrobe. Unbeknownst to me, I was being lured into the lion's lair. So they go meet the girlfriend. Warren brings her in and says, look who I brought. And she says, you're very beautiful. They talk about how they'd been discussing her in bed. Then Warren took over and said, we were hoping you would like to join us for dinner this evening, just the three of us. And she says, now I don't have to be hit over the head to know exactly what was being proposed. God knows I hadn't been to Europe, nor did I speak French, but I sure as hell knew a menage a trois when I saw one and proceeded to stammer and stutter through my response. Oh, um, that sounds very nice, uh, but I think, no, no, I'm sure I've got, I mean, I definitely have plans with my friend Todd. <laughs> menage a trois is a <laughs> funny way to say it. So then she says years later, she was sitting next to Warren Beatty and Annette Benning at some award ceremony. And they were like, oh, we love your show. And she's like, really? And they're like, yeah, we watch it in bed every night. And she was like, God, Warren's still discussing me in bed. <laughs> Boys, sometimes things do come full circle. So then we have this chapter about real estate, essentially, and about how hard it was for her and Peter to find the perfect home that they wanted to move into. I do not care about the search for a house. I don't care about finding the perfect place, dealing with real estate agents, any of that. What I want to know about your house is what kind of bed sheets you have. Here's a little thing about bed sheets that I don't think a lot of people know. Thread count is a myth. Is that true? It is absolutely true. Well, then what did Uptown Girls teach me? <laughs> Bull and Branch uses the best 100% organic cotton threads on earth for superior softness and a better night's sleep. The sheets aren't just buttery, breathable, and impossibly soft to start. They get softer with every wash. It is about the quality of the thread, not about the number of threads. You can put a million bad threads in a sheet. It's not going to be a great sheet. But when you use this 100% organic cotton thread, that is what gets you a wonderful sheet for a wonderful night's sleep. I love my Bull and Branch sheets. We got pairs. We have the Bull and Branch signature sheets. And, and they, I'm, a, I'm obsessed with them. And they do get softer with every wash. And, and they come in such good colors. You have white, but I have spruce. And I think that they make they bring me so much joy when I look in my room and I see beautiful, deep green sheets. Bull and Branch sheets fit the deepest of mattresses and are labeled with top and bottom tags so that making your bed is easier than ever. It is helpful. Best of all, Bowl and Branch gives you a 30-night risk-free trial with free shipping and returns on all orders so that you can just triple check that you are getting the best night's sleep possible. Trust me, you're going to want to keep them. Experience the best sheets you've ever felt at BowlandBranch.com. Miss the post Bowl and Branch April sale? Our listeners get exclusive access to a post-sale 20% site-wide discount through the end of April with the promo code WORM at BowlandBranch.com. That's Bowl and Branch, B-O-L-L-A-N-D, branch.com promo code worm for 20% off through the end of April. And once you are comfy in those sheets, experiencing what you thought was the most pleasure you'd ever felt. Well, I've got news for you. It gets better. Discover your pleasure with Dame's thoughtfully engineered toys. Dame offers discreet shipping, hassle-free returns, and a lot of fun. I did not know what I was getting in the mail when I when mine arrived. I was like a surprise gift. And then I was like, ooh, a surprise gift. <laughs> yes, I saw it. And I was like, I don't think I ordered anything. And then I remembered. And there it was a 
Calm Flexible Vibrator. It is a flexible vibrator that bends to your needs, wink, and contours to the shape of your body, wink, wink. (laughs) (laughs) It is an incredible way to de-stress. It's soft and bendy and has five different patterns, five different intensities. It's also completely waterproof. I'm, I'll, I'll, wink. I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> Claire, have you, uh, have you plugged in your palm yet? Mine came fully charged. Oh. So I was like ready to go. Maybe mine was fully charged. I charged it just in case and I was completely honest. I know that this isn't the most important part, but I was very impressed by the little charger cable. I found it very easy to use. I liked it. I mean, listen, I don't need to go into detail, but it worked. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> It worked for me, too. You know what I mean. (laughs) And you can get 10% off your first order at dameproducts.com when you use the promo code WORM. So her next big break is called Cadillac Man, which is a movie with Robin Williams that I think sucked. I think for a really long time she was only in bad movies. Yes. I think that she spent most of her career in pretty bad movies. But people always said she was wonderful in it, to which her manager, Elaine, said, it's better to be a shit in a hit than a hit in shit. But I always seem to be the latter. In fact, one magazine writer once coined me as the actress you can't forget and movies you can't remember. I do think that that is like a debatable sentence. A hit and shit versus shit and a hit. Well, I do think from the perspective of a manager or an agent, they would rather you be in like transmorphers. Well, that's not a movie. Yeah, but it's like, would you rather be the character actor in movies that don't go anywhere? Or would you rather be... Like a nothing actor in major movies. Yeah. I, I still think it's debatable because I do think that being great in a shitty movie, if anyone does see it, you're the one that they take away from it. Whereas like if you're a tiny nothing actor in a huge movie, no one remembers that you were in it at all. I think it's better. Would you rather be JLo and marry me or would you rather be an actress in something that bombs? I guess I was thinking of in quality of movie, not in money of movie. You know who was a shit in a hit? Who? I hated the actress that played Donna in that 70s show. <laughs> like, I love that show. And every time she's on, I'm like, this fucking sucks. Uh, it's your Scientology prejudice showing again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but so the whole premise of this goddamn chapter, Catalog Dog. Is that is, Chester was in the movie. Chester is her, uh, is her bug. I almost said annoying dog, but I'll call her a bug. <laughs> Chester is like this high maintenance yappy little dog who is in most movies apparently. Because Chester's just with her on set and then they'll be like, oh, we need a dog for this scene. And it really does make you wonder about how films are made. They just keep putting Chester and stuff. He ended up making $1,000 a week on this film. Yeah, he has a manager. He's doing better than us. <laughs> Which memoirist was like, I thought you just showed up and it worked. <laughs> oh, Mindy Kaling. Yeah. It does if you're a dog. <laughs> <laughs> so then she has this chapter called Growing Up is Hard to Do. By the time I turned 30, I began to notice that I'd never done anything by myself. If Peter had an audition or something, I'd search for another companion to do something with. And if all attempts failed, I'd simply lie in bed and yak on the phone with my mother until Peter got home. So she decides to go on a vacation alone. She's going to go to France to visit some friends, which is still not alone, but yeah, she's she's going without Peter. She's going on the plane alone. She literally took a cab to the airport by herself. (laughs) And she's going to meet her friend named Catherine Ireland Weiss, who is not Kathy Ireland. Not Kathy Ireland. So she has just been in a show that got canceled called Princesses with Twiggy. Yes. The model. And another girl that nobody liked. The show wasn't going well and they kept on kind of thinking it might come back for a season two. And then finally they were like, no, no they canceled it in the middle of the season and they were going to retool it for s- episode seven. Oh. And everybody on the set was like, hey, I can't wait to see what they retool. And Fran was like, this is dead. They are not going to retool it. They're going to like take it out to the back of the shed and kill it. <laughs> Which they did. Anyway, so then she's on this plane by herself and she runs into the president of CBS. So they kind of have a long conversation by the the water cooler of the plane. Yeah. The drink cart. I don't know. She's like, I was on the plane. I was looking like shit because I'm on a plane. And she's like, I was in sweatpants. And she decides to run into the bathroom and just put a little hair and makeup on. If I didn't think quickly, I might miss this moment. And I felt the frustration of indulging my insecurity in the moment and then kicking myself repeatedly afterward for not grabbing the brass ring on the merry-go-round. And I thought that was such a good line about times you haven't stood up for yourself or spoken out or like grab the bull by the horns because you're worried about the way you look. Literally, specifically that insecurity of being like, well, I don't look my best, so I'm not going to go for something. And I was like, that's so true. Just like do what you got to do and try anyway. So she does. And she 
walks out of the bathroom and there he is, the president of CBS, and they have a long conversation. We know that she is a great run into and have a conversation gal like we don't know from experience but everything we assume about her is that she would be the person you want to run into and have like a fun chat on the plane she tells him that she has a bunch of ideas for tv shows and he's like well when we get back to la we should we should talk about those can i also name drop something specific that they say in this book that i think is a relic of the 90s we chatted about the wonderful Relay and Chateau, a very exclusive, very discriminating membership of privately owned small inns and hotels around the world. Hotels that dotted the California coastline, New York, Los Angeles, yada, yada, yada. And she's like, luckily I'd stayed there once. This whole time she's like, every fancy thing that I've ever done, I'm like name dropping to impress him. And she's like, thank God I live outside of my means because I've done things I really shouldn't have. I just am interested in looking into it. If any of our listeners know about Relay and Chateau, is that a thing that still exists? I've never heard of it. Yeah, well, we're not rich. Yeah, but I feel like I like to dabble in awareness of the fancies. That's true. It would have been on a goop by now. You're the person who told me about Bruno Cuccinelli. Yeah. (laughs) Anyway, so then she writes, I was experiencing a moment where life was in perfect harmony. I felt us really connecting as he just nodded and then grabbed the stewardess for a scotch. So they have this great conversation. They make plans to meet up back in L.A. And then she's like, all right, this solo trip was worth it. And she calls Peter as soon as she gets off the plane to tell him who she ran into. And then she begins her solo, but like with friends trip. Okay. Can I just say, she says, guess who I ran into the plane? And Peter's first guess is Cher. And she goes, look how he goes right to Cher. She should only know how my husband has the hots for her. It is definitely the hots. So then we get to the weirdest chapter I've ever read in any memoir. And I say that having read almost 100 memoirs. She just gets to this chapter about her time visiting her friend in France and spending time with her friend and the two kids and how much she fucking hates these kids. The kid is like two and a half. And from the beginning, she's like, all he wanted was fruit. She kept asking for bananas. Like, he wouldn't shut up about the bananas. She starts calling him Dennis the Menace. She's like, we got him drunk at one point just to get him to fucking shut up. She's like, at one point, she's like, why don't you take him to town and see what happens? She's like, finally, when he was gone, thank God he stopped crying she's like she all she does is talk about how awful this kid was and then she ditches and goes to london to meet up with her friend twiggy but i was just like man listen i'm all about making fun of kids kids i'm all about like self-deprecating we tease bug i would never a chapter in my memoir being like anyway ashley got this dog it was a terror (laughs) and she is a terror listen i joke and i kid about bug but i love bug i wouldn't go too far because i know that that's your family and You can't really talk about people's families like that. Yeah, I do think that to be like, oh, then we had this kid and the kid was a little crazy and we had to, we were running around chasing after this kid. What a time. But you can't be like, God, this kid fucking sucked. I had to leave. I had to go to London and get out of France because this kid was terrorizing France. So then she goes to London. She stays with Twiggy and Twiggy's family. And this is where it gets even worse because she's like, now this was a family. Yeah, she's like, these kids were great. They were beautiful and proper. (laughs) She's like, they didn't fucking talk all the time. So she stays with Twiggy in Twiggy's house with her beautiful husband and their beautiful teenage children. And she's like, this is something. And they become the inspiration for the nanny. Yeah, she's like traipsing the daughter all over town because Fran wants to sightsee. And they kind of like start this joke that Fran is the nanny from hell. And they're like, that's it. That's the show. She comes into this beautiful proper home and like teaches her queen's tips to these fancy children. So then they go back to L.A. They call for a meeting with CBS, the guy that she had met on the plane, Jeff Sagansky. And they're like, well, you can have a meeting with the comedy development team. And when they get there and they're waiting for the meeting, they see Jeff and she goes up to give him a big hello and kiss. And she makes a point of being like the man who had all the time in the world for me on the plane suddenly treated me like a peon. Well, on the plane, he didn't have anything else to do. Yeah, they didn't have internet back then. Yeah, especially on planes. They don't have internet on planes now. We have yet to invent it. I mean, she says specifically on the plane, she illustrates that they made an announcement that the movie was about to begin. So their conversation ended because they both had to return to their seats because they wanted to watch the in-flight film. But So they pitch it. They don't hear back for a few weeks. Finally, they get word. It's been greenlit. They're going to do a pilot. Yes. So they start building out a team. They meet Rob and Prue, executive producing couple duo extraordinaire. Mostly they're going to write it. Peter and Fran pitched it. Peter's going to produce it. Fran's going to star in it. But Rob and Prue are the ones who are actually going to write it. And they wrote Who's the Boss, The Charmings, and Married People. I only know Who's the Boss. Yes, me too. But it seems like everything was a hit. So they finally set up this team. They've got the, the network, the writers, 
And she says, boy, I'll tell you, after 15 years of near hits, but mostly misses, it's sometimes hard to believe it when you're actually in the game, a contender, a player. But there we were, two kids from Flushing, interviewing executive producers and studios for our TV show that I would star in. She really is just so freaking excited. And it, it did take her a while. I mean, even though she always had these signs of success and like she was. She was in projects and she was doing well in projects. She was well received in everything she was doing, but she didn't have a hit. Yeah, there's a difference when you're like, make it. She wasn't famous. And then she has a little chapter on size and body image. She talks about Weight Watchers and eating three meals a day, never allowing herself to get so hungry that she makes the wrong choices. I sound like I got it all figured out, but believe me, I screw up plenty. Like this chapter was an ad for Weight Watchers and an inspo piece for like all those people out there fighting their weight. Yeah. It's not easy for me either, wouldn't you know? One of the weirder parts about it is she talks about how growing up, her family was very food oriented. And so her mom was always feeding her. And there was always like, well, are you hungry? We got to get some meat on your bones. And she's like, I didn't realize that there was something wrong with me, that my appetite was so big. And it's like, well, there isn't anything wrong. If you have a big appetite, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. She really acts like that was like a disease pushed upon her. And now that she's whittled her stomach down, it's like she's right on track. Yeah, I will say, because she she talks about her mom calling people too thin all the time and I don't know if it's everybody but I do feel like it's impossible to be the right size especially when everyone was like openly talking about weight all the time I feel like my mom was like you should lose a little bit of weight and then I like lost a bunch of weight and she's like you're too thin and I was like for the love of god point me to the right direction where's the line I do bet that she was literally the face of Weight Watchers at this point, though. Probably. Because she really is like, the thing that helped was Weight Watchers. The counting and the check-ins and the... Yeesh. It frees you from dieting. I love that concept of the diet that frees you from dieting. The way she wraps up the chapter, she has a friend who told her that her secret is not eating dairy. And she's like, I could never. That sounds ridiculous. And then finally she tries it and just cannot scream enough how great it is to not eat dairy she says today i'm finally liberated from a lifetime of yo-yo dieting by a healthy eating lifestyle and i'm now finally what the four-year-old me was intended to be at long last i mean her liberation is cutting out an entire category of foods (laughs) so then she moves on to how she cast and staffed the nanny if you love the nanny maybe you'd like this but she literally just walked through every character and the time she saw the audition to the time she I don't know I guess right now they're in season three (laughs) this is the kind of chapter that I always hate and I'll say it I've said it once and I'll say it again when they give you the background on how things happened I've never once been shocked when she's like you'll never guess how we cast Mr. Sheffield and we had auditions and then he was the one that we thought would be best for Mr. Sheffield. <laughs> and then sometimes they take us a curveball. Like we saw everybody and we didn't like anyone, but they had one last kid and that was the one. And you're like, okay, but still an audition. You've met him yeah. during an audition. And for the behind the scenes, they hired everyone they knew that they could hire. Very Jessica Simpson. Yeah. She says, I'll tell you when tape night for the pilot came, people always asked if I had many people I knew in the audience to which I always responded happily. Everyone I know is working on the stage. And this goes back to a conversation we had actually on TikTok. Not you and I, but a conversation we had with the TikTok about the fact that most of the people on The Nanny didn't get residuals. No actors. No actors got residuals. And I wonder if this was a thing then, because it does seem like she advocated for the people she knew and the people she wanted to see succeed. I just wonder if she like knew that that was a thing she should be advocating for. Or if it was something that was being advocated for. Yeah. I have like a vague recollection of when the Friends cast all banded together and said we all want the same amount of money. That was like dollars. revolutionary. Yeah. I will say like the amount of people she put in it though. She said, so Steve Posner, our mentor and the head of the theater department at our old high school became the dialogue coach for the Sheffield kids. Howie, a Dartmouth summa cum laude was a phone page until he got promoted to executive assistant. Rachel's husband, Greg, a former attorney worked as the production assistant until he got into the DGA stage managing training program. Zach, the guy who played my husband in Cadillac man plays uncle Jack. And then she had booked all these people that she had played with before, but that really is like, Hey, you want to come work with your friends? Yeah. We'll find a place for you. I love that. So they made the pilot. They actually did not get money from the network to make a pilot. They got money to make a presentation. But Prue and Rob were like, listen, we've made a bunch of hits. I've never had a presentation that got picked up and I've never had a pilot that didn't. So they were like, all right, we've well, got to stretch this presentation money into a pilot. They were like recycling as much as they could. They built their set out of hodgepodge throwaways from old sets. They were doing their own hair and makeup. They cut whatever they could. Yeah. And then they got picked up. They said it was like the highest testing pilot in three years. I have to say for season two, I'm getting ahead of myself, but they were 
slotted against Monday night, 8 p.m., which included Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And she said they came out on top when they premiered season two. I feel like Will said he did. Like, every single person is like, we were the number one in our time slot. And I do want to, like, look at the numbers and see who won. It's too bad. There's no way to find out. I know. It sucks that it's gone. <laughs> you had to be there counting all your friends. <laughs> You had to single-handedly Nielsen it and just call everybody you know and say, what did you watch tonight? (laughs) And in no way is it skewed. (laughs) So then she gets to a chapter about... Duplicity with publicity. Yeah, where she is told that she's a big star now and she needs better PR shots. So her PR person sends her to this photo shoot and they like fully strip her of control over her hair, her makeup, her wardrobe. She's like, this is how I like everything. And they were like, all right, but you are wrong about that and so she's trying to just hyper control every single thing and finally she lets go and gets truly a beautiful photo of herself yeah we'll put it on instagram but the caption for the photo is the end justified the means and i really think it did i think for me it was a really big lesson in like some people who are professionals know what they're doing and like let go of your image yeah sometimes you do have to like let go yeah I think that there is something that like you think you know what works best because it's just what you've been doing and she I mean the reason it spoke to me so much is because she says I had to do so much myself for so long I knew what I liked but it's like all right and now you're at a level where you don't have to do that for yourself let someone else take the reins and be a professional (laughs) I'm really fucking bad at that so then she has a chapter called help I need somebody and it's about when she needs a personal assistant because she's working So many hours and her personal life kind of falls apart, understandably. But what I found very interesting about this chapter is she hires this guy, Robbie. And after she teaches him everything, gets him familiar with how she likes things done, the errands that need to be run, she can tell that he's disgruntled and unhappy. So she thinks, what am I supposed to do? She's like, I can tell he thinks he's working below his station. And her husband is like, we'll just hire somebody else. And she goes, no, I know what I need to do. Give Robbie a raise. A raise, Peter yelled. How can you give him a raise when he's driving you crazy? She goes, well... I began to explain my theory. Look, I have certain needs that you must satisfy. God knows what he thought I was leading up to. But I realized that some of those responsibilities may make you feel like you're working beneath your station. And therefore, in exchange for doing an excellent job each week, I will supplement the meager salary the studio pays you with cash so that at least you'll know that I appreciate you in the most practical way possible. A couple of hundred dollars a week later, the station beneath which he worked started looking mighty fine. That's why I think that if there were people who were being paid unfairly on her set, I feel like she would have been advocating for them. Yeah, I also love that story because it's so true. If you want people to feel respected, pay them more. Just that sentence alone shows such insight that so many like workplaces don't have. At least you know I appreciate you in the most practical way possible. At the end of the day, cash is better than a handwritten note. Yeah, at the end of the day, I feel like a lot of people forget that, of course, you want people to have passion in their work, but they have to be doing it for something. And that is to make a living. At the end of the day, you're not your job. A lot of people who are like pursuing their passions forget that not everyone who's working with them cares as much as they do. You have to give them money. Yeah, he's not living his dream by being your assistant. You're living your dream by being in the star of a TV show. Yeah, I've worked at a lot of startups where they like really operate under this expectation that you're going to give as much shit as they do. And it's like, I don't have equity. This is not my dream. I'm just doing social media and I want to be paid more. (laughs) So then she has a chapter about how busy she is. And I don't know. You guys know how busy celebs are. I don't I think that's been a bit demystified by now. And then we get into a chapter that starts with a Howard Stern interview. And I want to trigger Warren sexual assault. So there is one jarringly horrific thing that happens in this book that she gets into. So she talks about being on set to do the Howard Stern show. This is when his radio show is being filmed as a TV show, I guess, on E! And she says, suddenly we hear Howard telling Robin that they've got Fran Drescher about to come out and he's going to talk about this horrible thing that happened to her. She was raped, Robin chimed in. I hope she'll talk to us about this horrible, tragic rape. And then Howard goes, I think her husband was held with a gun to his head and had to witness all this. Oh my God, Robin gasped. We're going to talk with Fran all about it right after these messages. So something different about the Howard Stern show than other late night shows is they don't do a pre-interview. So you really do have to go in there blind and he could throw anything at you. Yeah, and I guess what he wanted to throw at her was the fact that she'd been a victim of this horrific assault. Like, truly horrible in the way that you're like, if you were to make up, the worst thing. And so she says, I was forced to talk about it on the radio. People had written about it, but she had never come forth and told it. So she's like, in this book, I'm just going to speak on it in case it can help someone. But you can tell that she doesn't want to be talking about it. Yeah, I don't think she ever wanted to think about it ever again. And the fact that people keep bringing it up. I think she like wrote it in this book to be like, this is all of the info that I will ever give. So if you ever want it referenced, refer back to this paragraph. 
all of the details about what actually happened come from that Howard and Robin exchange. She herself mm-hmm. does not give any more like harrowing details. But what she says is basically, so January 5th, 1985, they had a friend over for dinner, Judy, and there had been a string of robberies in town that they didn't know about. Two brothers broke in with guns and robbed them and assaulted them. So she says that she had happened to watch a show where they interviewed police officers where they said most victims don't make good witnesses because they are dealing with the trauma. So they just like black out everything and they don't remember the faces. And she said, because I had just seen that interview, I was able to remember his face with such specificity that you would have thought he sat for his police sketch. Yeah. So she was able to go to the police luckily and give them a police sketch and using the sketch, they did a stakeout and were able to catch him the next week. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, obviously she's horrified and her response was that she wanted to leave LA and she was going to move to Massachusetts with Peter. They moved out of their apartment immediately. They stayed at Dan and Donna's. Elaine, God bless her, made me promise to trust her and give it six months. I didn't want to. Every bone in my body told me that she and all my other friends were crazy, but I did trust. And it was possible due to such experience that I was overreacting. I mean, I don't think she was overreacting. I don't think she was overreacting, but she does say, I feel like you're sitting around a campfire and you're encouraging me to put my hand in the fire, but only I seem to know the pain I'll endure if I do. I just can't go through something like that again. I don't want to fear so deeply. I won't withstand the depths of this pain again. I mean, she's in fear that it will happen again and that she won't survive it. And she starts going to therapy she's able to get victims compensation so she and peter are able to get money from the state for therapy and for recovery and they both jump right into therapy under such circumstances it's best to trust your loved one's instincts over your own no matter how wrong it feels and i did so elaine talked us out of making any rash life-altering decisions until some of the dust had settled and we could see life more clearly and she was right of course and for that we are most grateful And she says that most people responded to her Howard Stern interview very compassionately, full of love and protection. And she says, so to all those sisters who have suffered the indignity of a sterile emergency room rape test, I applaud your bravery and implore you to march on victoriously, a survivor as a woman in a sometimes violent man's world. You know, once you bottom out, there's nowhere to go but up. Remember, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Man, fuck Howard Stern. I like wonder if they would still do that today. I mean, that really is atrocious. Like, I understand that he's like a shock jockey that likes to go deep with interviews. But I do think to force trauma out of someone and like delight in how saucy it's going to be. And also just to like shock them with it. Do you know what I mean? Like the paralyzing fear of I do think like the word trigger gets kind of thrown around a lot these days. But if if you think that you should get a trigger warning on everything, imagine walking into a confrontation of your own specific personal trauma. That really is. A horrible thing to do somebody. Then we get some more life hijinks. She talks about throwing a dinner party for a bunch of executives where she accidentally catches her shirt on fire. So she has to take her shirt off and then she's not wearing a bra. And then she's like, ah, there I was topless at a dinner party. She talks about having this dinner party because she wants to get picked up for season two. And Jeff Sagansky is moving up at the company. So there's a new CBS president. And she's like, I knew what I would do to win him over. Have him over for dinner. And I'm just like, what is this, 1950s? It's so, like, like neighborhoody, leave it to beaver. Like, And I love that about her. I think it is what's so warm and charming is that, you know, she wants to talk to you about her career, so she's going to make you meatloaf. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking love meatloaf. Well, she said meatloaf in this, and I was like, God, if this beautiful, funny woman made me meatloaf, I'd be her gay husband. I thought you were going to say, if Fran can make a meatloaf, I can make a meatloaf. No, I can't do anything. I think that you should learn how to make meatloaf. Not in the summer. It's not the season for it. But maybe next winter. When I turn 30. I feel like if I've ever fucking met one person who would indulge in a frequent (laughs) summer meatloaf, it's you. I actually did go through a summer meatloaf period. It was a few years ago in August and it was so hot. But the meatloaf was so good that I was like, I don't care that I'm sweating. I got to get this meat in my gullet. I can't can't stay away from the loaf. Next year, though, mark my words, when I turn 30 and it's the winter, as a 30-year-old woman, I will learn to make my own meatloaf. I can't wait to have you over. I'm so excited. With mashed potatoes? That's a supper. (laughs) Okay, so then we get into this cute little chapter on the real Sylvia and Morty, who were the inspiration for the characters Sylvia and Morty. (laughs) (laughs) So we're talking about her parents, who were the basis of the characters 
of the nanny's parents. <laughs> and they were just the characters you see on TV. They're so cute. They're so fucking proud. They're so proud of her. At one point, her dad is like checking out at a store and the checkout person sees his last name and is like, Drescher, my favorite actress is Fran Drescher. And he goes, I'm the dad. We're the parents. I mean, more than that, she said that he'll walk around the pool at Florida with like a packet of photos of her and say, have you ever seen the show Na- The Nanny? <laughs> and people go, yeah, I love that show. He goes, that's my daughter. <laughs> Okay, and now she tells a story. First, she tells a story about meeting Barbara Streisand. That's so boring. I can't even. She goes to a Barbara Streisand concert, and believe it or not, because she is literally a very famous actress, she gets better seats than she bought. Yeah, and then she gets to meet Barbara Streisand. Who doesn't really know her, but whatever. But here's the story that I think both me and Ashley read six or seven times. It's very confusing. I guess we'll just read it aloud to you guys to see if you know what's happening. So she is introduced to Princess Diana at a fundraising event. They say, oh, this is Fran Drescher. She's the star of a very successful comedy series here in America in which she plays the title role of a nanny who works for a British widower and his three children. Wow, I was impressed, even if the princess wasn't. I wished the show was on in the UK because then she'd have a clue who the hell she was meeting. Oh, well, too bad for me, but it was still thrilling. I told her... When your time is chronicled in the history books, you shall be written as the heroine. With that, she looked at me as if for the first time deep in my eyes and said, thank you, that's very kind of you to say. I laughed my trademark laugh, at which point she looked at me again as this time to say, did that just come out of you? Quickly, I assessed whether I could get one more thing before being dismissed and ultimately decided to forge ahead. I mean, after all, we had just connected so well that I could schmooze for one more minute. By the way, I said, did you know you and I both made Mr. Blackwell's list? And then apparently... Princess Diana said, except I was on his best dress list and you were on the worst, she said. Nobody likes a bitchy princess, I thought, and added, meanwhile, honey, you had Princess Margaret on your list while I've got Demi and Madonna on mine. Princess, you're on the wrong list. Then I snapped a Z in the air and marched away until I reached the end of my train and could go no further since Diana was stepping on it. She's a size 10 shoe, at least. I tapped her broad square shoulder and pointed to her boat, I mean foot, at which point she released me. Or at least that's the way the story went by the time I got on stage as a presenter and began my speech by simply saying, well, the Queen of Queens got to meet the Princess of Wales. The audience went nuts and I became the belle of the ball. So did she and Princess Diana fight? I can't. Did that really happen? The book is about to get much worse. (laughs) I read these last 50 pages and I like my eyes had glazed over and I was just like, what the fuck? I couldn't figure out what's happening. It's just like winding. I'm like, are we still on the same vacation? Are you talking about a different vacation? I had this fear. I was like, well, maybe I was just burnt out from like reading it because I actually read this in three different settings. So I should have been fresh as a daisy. But I was like, I don't know. Maybe it's a Claire problem that I didn't know what was going on or it was so boring. But then Ashley calls me and goes, were those last 50 pages just nonsense? (laughs) I do think maybe because this book is from 20 years ago, they had a different page count. Maybe they've whittled down and been like, listen, if you only have 230, do 230. Also, I'd like to say this is 280 with enough photos that it probably was only 200. Maybe if you had gotten this book without the photos, you would have been like, this is a 120 page book. And they were like, all right, tell them about every country you've ever been to. And she's like, right on it, Captain. Yeah. And write it as if you're just saying it. Don't even go back and read it and make sure these sentences make sense. Anyway, so she went to Vermont one time to a fancy hotel. and then Where she got the flu and so it wasn't fun. For the seventh time in the book. I'm calling and it. And then the- again, she talks about a meeting with Francis Ford Coppola over the movie Jack. And she didn't want to go to the meeting because she was getting over the flu. And I'm like, you have got to drink more vitamin C. I think she's a you and that what she calls flu is a cold. I think she's getting one to two yeah, colds a year. Yeah, but she's not me because I power through. <laughs> I... She's just talking about places she's been, people she's talked to. Yeah, so this travel chapter goes on for about 20 pages, has a lot of photos where she looks stunning. I know you guys are all at home worried. Did Fran ever go on vacation? And she did. She did. So then she gets to the chapter Jack. She was in the movie Jack. And she talks about auditioning for Francis Ford Coppola and how her agents were like, this is the movie of the year to be in. Jack didn't do good. I've never heard of it. Yeah, it's where Robin Williams is like a big kid. Oh. He has like big kid disease. Oh, my God. Why did Francis Ford Coppola direct that? I forgot about that movie. Can you believe that that was like Godfather level? Anyway, she got the part. She was up against Cindy Crawford. But Francis Ford Coppola was like, you were just so sexy and warm on Conan. I'd never watched TV before, but I had to say, who's that sexy, warm woman? And he did like an impression of her. And his casting agent was like, that's Fran Drescher. I will say it helps to stick out. It does help to stick out. Anyway, her dog got to be in the movie again. She was supposed to be kind of trashy in the movie, I guess. So they had a run through at Francis Ford Coppola's Napa Valley 
vineyard and she showed up in character because she believes leave nothing to the imagination in terms of applying for a role. And I respect that hustle. So she shows up like in heels looking kind of trashy and they're just on his vineyard and they're supposed to spend the whole day there. He makes them play acting games and she's having to run around in a dirt driveway in heels and she gets like a fucking righteous blister. And then he invites everyone to stay for dinner and she says no. She's like, I had to go home and take a bath. And then she has this one offline. So she goes home. She skips dinner with Francis Ford Coppola. I kind of respected that. I was like, if you're not wanting to be somewhere, don't stay. But then she goes home and says she had room service with her husband in their hotel room. And after they fought over how much she was allowed to eat of the appetizer, they were happy by the entree. And I was like, if your woman shows up having ditched FFC, do not tell her what she's allowed to eat at dinner. Oh, my God. And then this is the last chapter. And I literally didn't know what it was about. So it starts off with her talking about how she has this house couple <laughs> A couple that helps tend to her house. And then she's talking about how her stunt double on the nanny had a bunion. And then she's talking about how she got her assistant on the Oprah show for a blind date. And then it ends with her getting a wax in Tel Aviv. (laughs) And the waxer is going so fast. And she's like, why are you going so fast? And the waxer says, life is so short. You must do everything fast if you want to get it all in. And then she also talks about how happy she is that her and Peter have had such success and that their mantra is go and do because you never know. And then finally she ends with another fake sex scene. And then she goes, only kidding, got you again. And the book ends. She really is like your aunt. You're like (laughs) cool aunt. She's the aunt that you think is the coolest woman in the world when you're like 10. And then then you you come back at 30 and you're like, oh, you're a bit off. <laughs> like the things that made you cool to a 10 year old are a bit off. The stories aren't Still going anywhere. fun though. Yeah. I mean, first of all, she seems so fun. She seems so funny. She seems so, she's who should be successful. And sometimes it just works out. Yeah. I'm so happy for her. I'm so happy for her success. I do wish she had gone deeper. Also, I'm interested in their decision not to have children. Not that like, of course she's allowed to not have children, but I can't imagine that it was like an easy decision to make from their backgrounds. I yeah. imagine her parents were like, really into them having children. So I'm like, sure like those late twenties, early thirties were an absolute screaming match. But I mean, what she got success as like the sexy TV girl in her thirties. That's incredible. Yeah. What is it like to be your own boss? I mean, there are a lot of things that I would like to hear. I don't think at the time she was already so ahead of her time in some ways that I don't know that she was available. Yeah. I guess I'm starting to realize that ghostwriters need to be good interviewers and none of them are. I, d- I don't think that that's the problem. I just think we want more than we're getting. That's I think true. We're specifically not reading good memoirs. That's true. This is one that I don't think you guys have to read. It is very confusing. I bet her next one is really good. And I if she wrote a third memoir, I would love for her in her like 70s to write a third memoir, Elvira style, because she did keep going. And I really am impressed with her. And I do think she is so funny. And I do love her voice. And I wish she used it to be a bit more open. Yeah. But I love Fran and I can't wait to like spend the next week looking at photos of her outfits. Oh my God. There's like a what Fran wore Instagram. Do you follow it? No, but you sent it to me. Okay. It's just an Instagram account full of all of the nanny outfits and they are fancy. You guys, last week on the Patreon, we did a deep dive on Jared Leto. We also, is that how you say it? I don't think so. Anyway, we did a deep dive on that guy. We also got into Ali Wong's divorce, J-Lo, Ben. This week, we're going to watch The Ultimatum and review it and discuss it. And then also, of course, don't forget The Moment House. There's like five tickets left for the Chicago Late Show. And then also, don't forget the Facebook wormhole. It's so fun. People are doing these meetups and making friends there, which is really like... I'm so... I wish I could go to all of them. I want to fly to London. I want to... It's one of the few things I'm like proud of in my life, that there's like that little community and people are really nice in it. And I, I'm like, I can't believe there's a nice Facebook group that exists on earth. And it's I so can't beautiful. believe it has to do with our podcast. So I love you guys. I'm so excited. And Ashley, who do you love this week? Oh, our five-star reviewers. I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, I adore you. Thank you. Thank you so much to Allison Renee. You are an absolute shining sun. Thank you to Cabs Joe J. I would catch a cab to wherever you want to go. Thank you to Ab is Coma. I hope you come out of that coma soon. Thank you, intellectual lady. I love an intellectual lady. Thank you to Les L99999999. I would dial nine to hang out a little bit more. Thank you, Ghost Gang 101. 
I appreciate you sticking around to haunt us. Thank you, Zeb Minton. Love some wintergreen mint. Very refreshing. Thank you, Katie57. I would prefer 57 Katie's over 57 Heinz's. Thank you, Paige is so cool. You really fucking are. Thank you, Lily G5479, an absolute G. Thank you, Andy SF. I would love to come visit you in SF. Thanks to Superstar325. I love you almost as much as I love Molly Shannon. Thank you, Emily Jade1997. You are an absolute gem. Thank you. Kelevated. I wish that you two had written a song called Kelevation. Thank you, Ale Not Larios. I fucking love a refreshing ale. Thank you, Cat Zero. Well, you're a 10 to me. Thank you, Travis Barker's Fleshlight. Oh, saucy. Thank you, Abby G. Watson. You are the absolute brains behind this Sherlock operation. Thank you, Granny Shorts. You are much sexier than people give you credit for. And that is it for this week. Thank you, guys. I love you.